From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. In the U.S., the Biden era has begun. After four years of chaos, misinformation, and crisis that marked Donald Trump's presidency, Joe Biden takes the reins of a deeply divided nation in the midst of a devastating pandemic. A call for unity, truth, and trust. America faces a steep hill to climb. We turn once again to Edward Keenan, Toronto Star's Washington bureau chief, to talk about the wild last days of Trump and the first 100 days of Biden. Ed, it's good to talk to you again from D.C. Adrian, I'm so happy to be here. Before we talk about Joe Biden, the 46th president, I wanted to quickly talk about the departure of the 45th, Donald Trump. Trump left the White House on Wednesday morning, and before he did, he gave a speech. Just a goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. So have a good life. We will see you soon. The tone was, I think suffice to say, defiant. He did not concede any mistakes. He did not talk about the state of the country. We've seen presidential departures before, obviously. What did you make of this one? Well, I mean, it's unlike presidential departures before, because typically, with the exception maybe of Richard Nixon, who resigned in disgrace, all these previous presidents who were alive at the time when they left office attended the inauguration of their successor and wished them well. And our our sort of parting image of them was this handoff. Trump decided not to participate in that. He did release a video message on Tuesday night in which he sort of acknowledged that he was leaving and said that he offered prayers and best wishes for the new administration. He repeated something like that in his speech at Andrews Air Force Base before he got onto Air Force One and flew to Florida. He spent a lot of time giving a sort of campaign style speech outlining what he thought his accomplishments were. He said, you know, I I will be back in some form. And, you know, at the end, he ended off by saying, have a nice life and see you later. There is some speculation about what form I'll be back in some form, he said, whether or not partly that will depend on this impeachment proceeding, whether or not he's allowed to run for president again, whether he forms a new political party, as there's been talk of in the last few days, whether his reputation fully recovers within the Republican Party, where he has lost some significant amount of support and how he continues to be able to sort of communicate with and lead or whether he tries to do so with his significant base of followers who still exist. Even independent of what he does in the future, the country he leaves behind is grappling in a really significant way with the legacy of his presidency. And that's that's something that you saw in Trump's absence, but really remarkably saw at Joe Biden's inauguration. So we shift to the inauguration of Joe Biden. As is custom, he gave a speech from the Capitol. What were your big takeaways from his message there? Before getting directly to his message, I think the setting of it really set up the challenge that was at the core of his message, right? From where he's standing on the podium, he looked out on a relatively small, for the standards of this kind of event, crowd of dignitaries, all of them wearing COVID masks. And then beyond them, he's looking at black wire, tall fences with lines of soldiers, not in their formal dress uniforms, in their combat uniforms, their camouflage with guns to protect the event against, you know, potential threats from some other Americans. You know, he's standing on a spot where two weeks ago, almost to the hour, you know, Trump supporting insurgents took over the Capitol violently in an event meant to keep him from being inaugurated. And so the absence of people because of security concerns, just completely a maze of fences protected by soldiers. It really spoke to this moment of, as he's giving this address, it it was a very 2021 scene of where they're at in the pandemic and the political situation. That's right. He talked about this as being a moment that is among the most challenging moments in American history. And he invoked some of those things I just touched on that he could see from the podium there. 
the COVID crisis that claimed 400,000 American lives and continues unchecked spread of the coronavirus in every state in the United States. The civil unrest over partisan politics caused by Trump supporters unwilling to accept the results of the election, as well as the civil unrest about racial injustice that has been taking place over the past year, the economic crisis that goes with those. He talked about this in a way, it was not by any means a gloomy inaugural speech. He didn't, like Donald Trump four years ago, had a kind of theme of American carnage, of really kind of pouring on some negativity and presenting himself as the solution to that. But Biden was like, he appeared kind of clear-eyed in presenting a series of challenges, like overlapping crises that the United States faces. And then he talked about rising to the historical moment to face them. As expected, he said that he thought unity was needed to sort of meet this moment. But he kind of dismissed the idea that talk of unity was pie in the sky or goofy. For without unity, there is no peace, only bitterness and fury. No progress, only exhausting outrage. He kind of focused on this theme that disagreement shouldn't mean disunity, right? And he talked about moments in the United States past history, the Civil War, World Wars, the Great Depression, when meeting challenges, how Americans had come together and dealt with them and come out as one of the strongest, most prosperous countries in the world. He said, enough of us have always come through to carry all of us. And that's what he's sort of proposing right now. So, I mean, I think it it was in a lot of ways, like a really powerful inaugural speech, not just me, but I think a lot of the other historians and journalists who've been covering presidential politics for a long time agreed that it it sort of addressed the moment in a really effective way and and kind of harnessed his message. And with that message is coming a series of actions in his first early time in office to try and put some meat on the bones of that rhetoric. Biden also pointedly in a way that I don't remember many U.S. presidents speaking about in their inauguration, talking about truth or the concept of truth. And it seemed to nod at how misinformation and conspiracy theories have driven divisions in the U.S. Recent weeks and months have taught us a painful lesson. There is truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. Can you speak to that? Yeah. And I mean, I think this is a dig directly at Donald Trump. Just like the talk about how sort of disagreement doesn't have to be a raging fire that consumes us in the kind of carnage that Donald Trump talked about, but also the kind of way he whipped up disagreements and conflict, a return to truth, a promise to be honest, but also a call to Americans to elevate truth as a fundamental American value, something worth defending and seeking out just like liberty and justice and freedom. So, I mean, I think that is remarkable and it also speaks to again, how he enters office. We'll be right back. So let's get to the first 100 days. That's always a significant marker for any U.S. presidency. What do you think we can expect in the first 100 days of Biden and Harris? Again, he outlined key priority areas, COVID, racial justice, climate change, and sort of immigration policy. These are things that he's highlighted. And then the economic fallout of the COVID crisis You know, on his very first day in office, before he even delivered his speech, his staff had already circulated a list of the 15 executive orders that he was planning to sign and was going to proceed to sign later in the day after his inauguration. You know, some of them just canceled things that Donald Trump had done, right? So, and and certain detention policies at the border for immigrants, re-entry into the Paris Climate Accords, a series of initiatives dealing with racial justice and policing. But I mean, noteworthy to Canadians is that on his climate first day agenda was canceling the Keystone XL pipeline, which was to be constructed basically to carry Alberta oil sands oil into the United States market. 
And even prior to the inauguration, politicians in Alberta, Premier Jason Kenney. That would be a, in our view, a serious economic and strategic error that would set back Canada-U.S. relations with the United States' most important trading partner and strategic ally. Certain members of the federal Canadian government were not happy about that already, and we're already speaking out about that. No, and they're probably not going to get any happier about it. But I think at a certain point, they've got to be resigned to it. That Biden has been very clear about this for a long time. It's not a surprise. In a lot of other ways, both in climate policy, but economic policy, but also how they cooperate on the world stage, Canadian governments are going to find the Biden administration an easier partner to work with and one whose goals align more closely with theirs than maybe Trump's did. And so this is a significant trade-off, especially for the people of Alberta who are, through their government, big investors in that pipeline. Politically, diplomatically, this is sort of, it's not a lot to be gained by trying to relitigate that. But maybe it was suggested to me in the run-up to the election by some sort of experts of various stripes, that there's a potential there that the Canadian government kind of behind closed doors can kind of use this as a chip. Like we took this hit on Keystone. Now what can we do together? Like maybe there would be cooperation potentially offered by the American government in recognition of the fact that Canada was really hurt by this policy. I mean, those are significant sort of day one policies and Keystone will jump out for Canadians, but it's one of a series of actions being taken place on the first day, but also then an economic package that sends another round of stimulus checks out to Americans, a raise in the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Some of these are permanent sort of economic initiatives. In the inaugural address, Joe Biden was talking about unity. And part of it is that he's going to be making a show now, but I think in reality, an actual attempt to work with those Republicans on the Senate. He has a longstanding, decent relationship with Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, that he's hoping will make that a productive relationship. There are some big guns in the arsenal if unity doesn't materialize, but plan A is to hope that they can get at least some Republicans on board. This is such a monumental job that Biden faces right now, because as you mentioned, there is a pandemic going on. There is an economic crisis. And then there's something else that is hanging over this, which is the second impeachment of Donald Trump. Biden said last year that he does not think it's good for democracy to prosecute a former president, that he was willing to leave it up to the Justice Department on that front. How do you see the impeachment moving forward with the Senate? Well, I mean, I think there's really two different questions in those pieces of information that we just brought up. Many people throughout American history have thought it can be very politically toxic to have former presidents investigated for crimes or charged with crimes because it looks like a tit for tat political war. It just more deeply politicizes things. It's partly why Gerald Ford, it was the justification for Gerald Ford pardoning Richard Nixon was so that the country can move on. I think when a lot of people were calling for George W. Bush to be prosecuted or members of his administration to be prosecuted for potential war crimes and whatnot over the Iraq war, refighting that battle is going to be a political war with a lot of casualties. And one of those casualties is going to be my own political agenda. Right. You're spending capital in order to do this. Yeah. And that's where this does overlap with impeachment. Impeachment, unlike the criminal justice system, is a purely political process. Donald Trump was impeached before he left office. It's now a matter of completing that process by having a trial. One of the punishments available in that trial, I mean, one is removal from office, which doesn't apply anymore. But the other is being disqualified for running for office again in the future or from holding high office again in the future. And I think Joe Biden is kind of arm's length from that process. That's a a Senate controlled process. And he's somewhat insulated from any accusation that he's now vengefully pursuing Trump because he really had nothing to do with it in the lead up to his inauguration and in the aftermath. But what it does mean is that while the Senate's dealing with that is the time it spends holding a trial and whatnot is not time it's spent confirming Biden's cabinet appointees. And it's time that the Senate and the Congress is not taking up the kinds of bills that he wants passed to get his legislative agenda going. The press continues to relitigate Donald Trump's administration when politically he's trying to enjoy 
his honeymoon, you know, the first days of the Biden administration, look at all I'm getting done. So, I mean, there's some political risk in that. But I think Biden has said as recently as Tuesday night during the COVID ceremony that kind of healing requires a sort of reflection on the wounds that have been caused, like what's lost. And I think in other contexts, other people close to him have said, you know, sort of that you need accountability to have healing. And so sort of reckoning with where the country is right now, especially in the wake of the storming of the Capitol. What does a successful 2021 look like for Biden? And how might we view that here in Canada? Really, a successful 2021 for Joe Biden is basically seeing the back end of the coronavirus once and for all. And I think that's true of almost every country in the world is hoping for that. But Donald Trump's failure, almost comprehensive failure to deal with coronavirus effectively, and also his disinterest in doing so, especially after the summer, dealing with coronavirus, limiting the number of new infections before a vaccine can be widely administered, how effective a vaccine is widely administered, If people can go visit their families at Christmas without worrying, I think that would be one measure of success. If most of those people can afford to buy Christmas gifts while they're there, that might be another measure of success. I think getting his economic package passed and then starting to see that money injected into the economy, people seeing checks in their mailboxes and raises potentially and things like that, if this stimulus is actually stimulating the economy and working a year from now, that'd be another measure for success. Climate policy was a big part of his platform. And so I think success for him is also going to be judged by progress towards those goals. That will be less in a one-year time span measuring emissions and more measuring the number of policies he gets passed or regulations he manages to put in place. He and a lot of other people will measure success on sort of reestablishing diplomatic relationships with other countries, trying to restore the U.S. position, sort of leadership position in the world. And then I think finally, this is a difficult one to figure out exactly what the metrics are. But I think if unity was the promise of his campaign, if a less divisive president was the promise that he made on the campaign trail, and virtually one of his only biggest promise about himself personally was that he could bridge that gap. A year from now, how do you measure if the anger level across the United States is ramped down, if people are talking to each other. That's a much harder metric to say. He says, let's lower the temperature. How do you measure that? We will be watching, and I think a lot of us are watching gingerly, anxiously, to see if the feared rise in sort of extremist right-wing terrorist attacks or like a militia attacks to deliver some kind of promised civil war, are we going to see those kinds of attacks in the months to come or not? It's a hard thing, as you know, as we were saying, to know what number you look at to measure it. But I think sort of assessing things a year from now to say, is this something that there's been progress made on? Or is this a country that's more divided than ever? That's going to be one way that you have to measure Joe Biden's success as well. Ed, thank you once again for your time. Thanks, Adrian. And that is Edward Keenan, Toronto Star's Washington bureau chief, talking to us from D.C. That's it for today. Thanks for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Adrian Chung, Saba Aitazaz, and Raju Muthar. Produced and mixed by Sean Patton, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to This Matters at the star.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at the star.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.